Hi there, this is what you need to know before you buy the Surface Pro X. Microsoft recently announced the new Surface Pro X as a breakout device in the Surface line. It's got a similar chassis size to the Surface Pro 7, but a bigger, almost bezel-less screen. It has a brand new keyboard with an embedded pen. It's really amazing. By the way, that new keyboard and pen doesn't work with the old Surface Pros, the Pro 7, the Pro 6, for example. But it has this new keyboard set up with that embedded pen, which is going to be far less likely to get lost. So it's really cool. The pen would work, however, without the keyboard, it's probably not that much good and we'll stick with the old pen setup. But one of the most important things to know about the Surface Pro X is the processor that's going to be inside of this device. Instead of using a traditional Intel Core processor, Microsoft have worked with Qualcomm to create a new processor that they call the SQ1. This processor runs on the ARM architecture very different to the x86 architecture that we're used to on previous Surface Pro devices and on Windows PCs forever. The big question is, what are the implications of this new processor architecture on us as Surface Pro users? To understand that, we kind of need to go back a little bit and really immerse ourselves in what these processors are and what they do. There are two dominant processor architectures in today's computing world. We have Intel with the x86 platform on the one side, and we have ARM on the other side. ARM processors are traditionally used in mobile devices like phones and tablets, and Intel processors x86 used in PCs, servers, laptops. In this video, I'm not going to go into depth on the difference between the ARM and the x86 platforms, but if you're looking to buy the Surface Pro X, I think you need to know, so I'll leave some links in the description below to other videos that really explain this quite well. So rather than talking about the technicalities, I want to talk about the practical implications of these two processor types. And to do that, let's think about a device like the Surface Pro 7 versus something like an iPad Pro. The iPad Pro has a custom designed ARM chip built in to the device, whereas the Surface Pro 7 has that Intel x86 core i5 or i7 chip built in. Now that Intel core chip, I kind of think about it like it's a bit of a Swiss army knife. It's a, it's a chip or a processor that can pretty much do anything. If you want to run your device and plug your digital camera in, or you want to run a couple of screens on it through the docking station, it has all of the code that's needed built into that processor to do all of those different things. On the other hand, the ARM chip needs to be custom designed to do any one of those tasks. So what we see the approach with Apple is that their devices usually don't have many of those functions at all. You wanna plug your memory stick into your iPad? That hasn't been possible up until very recently on the iPad Pro, simply because the code needed to do that was never built into the processor. And these things need both software and hardware to make them run effectively. Back on our Windows PC, our Surface Pro 7, we could do things like virtualization. For example, I could run an emulated iPad environment or an Android environment right on my PC because the code that's needed is built into that Intel processor. On the other hand, over on the iPad, I can't do virtualization in any way, shape or form because it's simply not built into the processor. On my PC, I can run 32-bit, 64-bit programs. I can do whatever I want. The software that I have will usually run on my Windows PC, almost without exception. On the other hand, on the iPad, if the code's not built into the processor and Apple haven't allowed the app through their store, then it's simply not going to run. So you can see that there's two very different approaches, usually, to using an Intel processor and an ARM processor. ARM applications are typically very limited because of the nature of the processor, whereas Intel devices tend to be a very utilitarian tool that can be used for practically anything. And there's of course trade-offs to both of those approaches. On the iPad, we have instant on capabilities, much better battery life in a much smaller, thinner, lighter device. Compared to the Intel approach with the Surface Pro, for example, we have a heavier device that's bigger, puts out more heat and uses a lot more power. So in the past, the approach was pretty easy. If you wanted something that could do absolutely anything, well, you got a Windows device with an Intel chip in it. On the other hand, if you wanted something that could do just a few things, but do them very well, you went with something like an iPad. 
So along comes Surface Pro and throws a spanner in the works. We now have a device that can run full Windows 10 on top of the ARM architecture. By the way, this isn't the first device to come out running Windows on ARM. In the last year, a number of OEMs have also released devices that can do this. So I'm calling 2019 the year of the processor because here in the one Surface range, we've got three different processor manufacturers. We've got AMD building chips for the Surface Laptop 3. We've got Intel and ARM chips sitting side by side in the Surface Pro range. This kind of diversity is unprecedented. But the question of course is why would we even want Windows to run on the ARM architecture? Well, the ARM architecture gives us that small form factor benefit. Because those processors produce less heat, they're more power efficient, they can be packed into smaller, thinner, lighter devices. They also have instant on capability and a fantastic long standby time. So if you turn the device off, it's not gonna be running down like an Intel processor based device would be. In order to make this happen, Microsoft have been busily working away on Windows 10, enabling it to run on top of the ARM architecture. And they've done a pretty good job of it this time. On the Surface Pro X, you'll be able to run most of the applications that you would normally have run on your Windows PC. Favorite web browser, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, you could run any of those programs. Extensions, your favorite accounting package, if it was still PC based, most of them are in the cloud these days, but that would still work as well. Maybe you're running some point of sale software, or just traditional Office applications, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. They will all work, as you'd expect, on the Surface Pro X. And everything that we're hearing about the Pro X is that those applications would actually work quite well. That the performance is good enough to pass off as a Pro-style device. All of those programs can now run thanks to the emulation or the translation that Microsoft have built into Windows and into that processor that converts code that was written for Intel processors over to the ARM processor. Unfortunately though, there are some limitations in this emulation. For example, if your program was written in 64-bit, it won't work on Windows 10 on ARM. Windows 10 on ARM only supports 32-bit programs. If you don't know the difference between a 32-bit and a 64-bit program, then it's probably not gonna bother you. But programs, for example, Adobe Audition or Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop are all programs that typically use 64-bit code to take advantage of the performance that 64-bit offers. Now companies like Adobe could release an edition of their software that is written specifically to work on the ARM architecture and then it would run fantastically on the Surface Pro X. Who knows, they might do that. But for now, when we try and run that software on Windows 10 on ARM, we're going to find that even if we can run it, that the emulation layer causes it to run slowly and not live up to the performance that the device is capable of. On top of that, you might find that certain device drivers don't work on this architecture. And additionally, programs that are written to hook into Windows operating system components like the File Explorer may not work either. A really important example of that would be the Dropbox Sync Client. Normally when I install Dropbox on my Surface Pro, it installs a little icon in my file explorer that shows me all of the files from my Dropbox account. Now that's not possible with this Surface Pro X device. So you can see that although we can do a lot of stuff on the Surface Pro X, there's going to be a few small things that you'll run into that you can't do on this device. So why would you put up with these limitations? If your work is limited to a few simple things like using Office applications, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, responding to emails, checking the web, viewing things online, reading stuff, the Surface Pro X could be a really good device. But the moment you wanna go and plug your digital camera in and load some photos into Photoshop or Lightroom, you're gonna be hit with the limitations of this device. Something else to consider is that the Surface Pro range has traditionally sold very well in the corporate market. In fact, one of the presenters in that launch event said that Microsoft has sold the Surface Pro into 75% of the Fortune 500 companies. And that's something that we've seen here in Australia is that corporate, the corporate market is huge for this product. However, the Surface Pro X being built on this ARM architecture likely doesn't have the components that IT pros need to remotely deploy their standard operating version of Windows 10 onto that device. 
I'd say it's highly unlikely that that typical deployment scenario is going to work on these devices. That means that companies need to adopt modern device management methods like Microsoft's Intune in order to be able to look after these devices, to put the software that they need onto these devices to manage them and restrict, of course, what people can do. So if you're thinking of evaluating the Surface Pro X for a corporate deployment and you don't have those modern management methods in place already, like Autopilot and Intune, then this device is simply not going to work for you. You're going to be stuck with the Surface Pro 7. And the unfortunate part of that is that Microsoft haven't announced an LTE version of the Surface Pro 7. So if you want to deploy an LTE device, the Surface Pro X is really your only option. For me, in order to be able to call a device Pro, it needs to be my one device that can do everything that I need it to do. To figure out if the Surface Pro X is that device for you, have a close look through your app list and figure out what you do and don't need, what kind of apps you use on a daily basis, and then go and find out if those apps are going to run on the Surface Pro X. If it ticks all of the boxes for you and you pre-order the device, you can look forward to getting a very sleek, fantastic looking new Surface Pro with that new keyboard and pen, and it will be a really awesome note-taking device for you. If not, the Surface Pro 7 is still a good option. We'll be ordering both devices in, and the moment we get our hands on them, we'll give you a full hands-on review. So if you found this video helpful, remember to give us the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so that you can get updates on the Surface Pro X and the Surface Pro 7 as they arrive. The Surface Pro range has traditionally, traditionally, tra <laughs> traditionally, <laughs> I'm going to get the giggles. All right. I got it. I got this. Don't you worry. Traditionally.